while others much prefer moving water. Also, some plants enjoy shallow water, others can be planted in water up to a couple of feet deep, while still others, <laughs> they just like to float on the surface. So make sure you read the plant tags carefully and get to know the plant's preferred habitats and growing conditions. These papyruses, for example, are at home in still water, and I'm gonna plant them in some pockets or bogs adjacent to the pond. There are actually six such bogs, four in the stream and two adjacent to the pond. At the time of construction, the bogs were backfilled with river rock, which I now have to remove to make a planting hole, if you will. And with that done, I'll remove the plant from its container, place the plant in the hole, and replace the river rock to stabilize the plant. I'll then repeat the process with the remaining papyruses. One more in this bog, and three in this one. I actually have two different papyruses growing here, although they look remarkably similar. One is a Mexican papyrus, and the other is an Egyptian papyrus. Both grow to about eight feet tall, and both are tropicals. Umbrella palms look somewhat similar to papyrus, but they don't grow near as large. In fact, the dwarf form only gets to about two feet. Oh, and one more thing, umbrella palms really love to be planted in moving water. So I'll plant them in areas where the water flows, using the same planting technique that I applied to the papyruses. And just look at how the foliage of the plants helps soften the stone. Next up is a type of ornamental grass that loves the water. It's called ribbon grass, a variegated form no less, and it actually prefers to grow in shallow water. Another lovely grassy plant is this star grass, and it too prefers shallow water. I just love the white bracts that form at the tips of the stems, and they last all summer long. Continuing with the grassy theme, here are two types of cattails, one solid and one variegated. The solid form, known as graceful, grows to about four feet and is hardy to zone three. The variegated form, called variegata, gets a tad taller, but is just as hardy. It also tolerates a bit more shade. Yet another grass-like plant is this Louisiana iris, a form of iris that thrives in water or boggy sites and is hardy to zone four. This one should produce white flowers within a few weeks. After all, its name is White Moon. Across the stream, I've planted this colocasia to give the umbrella palm some company. Colocasia, or taro, is related to the more familiar elephant's ear, and it does fine in water gardens. This one is a variety called Illustrious, and it'll grow to about three feet tall. Also along the stream, I planted some lizard's tail, in this case, a red-stemmed variety. Lizard's tail is a North American native that's hardy to zone four. And next to it, I've added three Ruellias, also known as bluebells. These are zone eight plants, which means they won't survive the winter here, but they'll do fine up until fall arrives. And here's some royal pickerel, an upright beauty that's hardy to zone six and can grow five feet tall. Okay, that about does it so far as the more upright plants are concerned. Now it's time for some low growing specimens. Like this water mint, a true mint that thrives in water and can spread just as fast as the terrestrial variety. And this little clump of blue mazes, another fast spreader that blooms sporadically throughout the year and is hardy to zone four. By the way, a number of aquatic plants do indeed have a tendency to spread, often to the point of being invasive. So either be prepared to keep their growth in check or consider this alternative, a floater. With these little foam islands, you can stick container-grown plants that tend to spread in the pre-cut holes, pots and all. In this case, I'm planting four variegated pennyworts and some water celery, which is actually edible, as the centerpiece. I'll then launch the island into the pond, and in time, the plants will spread to cover the exposed foam, but not grow much beyond the edge of the island, especially if you have koi in your pond, fish that love to nibble on plant foliage and roots. Among aquatic plants that have a tendency to spread, this water hyacinth is perhaps the most notorious. If allowed to escape into a nearby body of water, a river or lake for instance, it can quickly take over. As a result, its sale is outlawed in many states. However, it's not a real threat here, so I'm going to complete my planting scheme by adding a few clumps. 
And now, in addition to enhancing the overall look of my water feature with varying heights and textures, these plants offer an added bonus. You see, aquatic plants not only look great, they also help keep the water clean because aquatic plants make great natural or biological filters. And they complement the nearby terrestrial plants that surround the outer edges of the pond and stream. There's no question that as time goes on, I'll add a few more plants here and there, both aquatic and terrestrial. But for now, well, like I said earlier, I'm content to just sit here, sip on a cup of coffee, and listen to the sound of running water. Next on Gardening by the Yard, hardscape for your landscape. Even caves! It's really no secret that I'm a big fan of stone, from flagstones to large boulders. So much so, in fact, that I've used over 100 tons of stone here at my place for everything from borders to paths to patios. So today I'm going to feature all kinds of stone and in a manner aimed at helping you understand the world of stones better, especially how to pick the right stones for your projects and how best to use them. And that means taking a trip to my favorite spot for stone shopping. Chances are there's a place like this close to where you live, a place where you can find virtually every stone imaginable. And whether you're in the market to actually purchase stone or just look around, <laughs> it's a whole lot of fun just to hang out in these places. And many of them are a rich source of ideas, especially those that have really cool stone structures of one form or another, whether water gardens, even caves. You might also find such things as bridges, benches, arches, columns, even fountains. The type of stone available to you will depend largely on the geology of your area. But generally speaking, the three most common types of stone are sandstone, limestone, and granite, and all are available in different forms. For example, stones may be cut to uniform shapes and sizes, or they may be irregularly shaped. Cut stone is more expensive than is often used in formal designs, while uncut stone is often used to create a more informal look. Stones may also be smooth or rough. Smooth stones are ordinarily used for paved areas, but rough stones can be walked on as well and are often less slippery when wet. Of course, stones may be flat, which again are most often used as pavers for patios, paths, or as stepping stones. Or they may be more like boulders in sizes ranging from mini to massive. Among flat stones, the thickness of the stone can vary considerably. Now in the lingo of stones, a flagstone is any flat stone that's three inches thick or less. And I should add that one inch thick stone is typically too fragile for use in outdoor projects anyway. But two and three inch thick stones are great for patios and paths. And they work equally well whether laid on top of soil or gravel or mortared in place. Laying the stones on mortar produces a crisp finished look, but laying them directly on soil and allowing plants and grasses to grow in between the joints looks great too. Beyond flat stones are variously shaped stones. These are the most versatile of all because they can be used for an endless array of projects. In creating stone walls, for example, whether mortared or dry stack, these stones create striking patterns and textures. Here are just a few examples of what can be done with stones of varied shapes and sizes. Pretty cool, huh? Glacier stones are ideal for certain projects. I especially like using them to create water gardens. Tumbled stones such as these come in handy as well. I use them to create simple borders for my ornamental beds. Mid-sized stones such as these are extremely versatile and I use them for all kinds of different projects. I especially like them for creating dry stream beds and they're the best stones of all for water features. And let's not forget boulders, perhaps my favorite stones of all. Boulders come in every size and shape imaginable, from flat to rounded to just about everything in between. And they're often full of character. They make great specimens in the garden, whether as standalone sculptures or as part of a stone feature. River rock or gravel is another form of stone that's used in all kinds of projects, from paths to water features. And it comes in a variety of shapes 
sizes, and colors. River rock also combines well with other types of stone, such as here in this path, but it also looks great on its own. When shopping for stone, here are a few important things to keep in mind. All stone is sold by weight, and you can purchase stone by the piece or by the pallet. If you choose to hand pick each and every stone, that's fine, but it'll cost you more. Palletized stone is cheaper and easier to transport, but you may not be able to inspect every stone in the pallet. Most places that sell stone offer both full and self-service. Full service, which often includes delivery, will cost you more, but it's very often worth it, especially if you don't have a truck or a trailer. If you do have a truck or trailer, you'll likely be asked to drive onto scales that weigh your rig before it's loaded, then again after it's loaded. You'll then be charged for the difference in weights. Two more important considerations. Places like this can be dangerous, so make sure you wear heavy shoes, and whatever you do, don't let kids wander around unsupervised. Also, watch out for spiders, perhaps even snakes in some areas. Stones provide ideal hiding places for those kinds of critters. And finally, remember that stones can be deceptively heavy. Even a relatively small stone can weigh several hundred pounds. So use a dolly or pay to have someone move your stones with heavy equipment. Working with stone provides me a certain pleasure, and the look it adds to a landscape is unique. So consider taking the time to learn more about stone and how it can improve the look of your landscape. And who knows, maybe you'll discover the same pleasures. Up next on Gardening by the Yard, are you thinking about planting a new tree in your landscape? Well, just hold on. You're going to want to check out this next story. 90% of the trees that I removed were because they were put in the wrong place. Check out over what these make good sense. Dollars and cents, that is. In a well landscaped yard, trees can increase property values by as much as 20%. There are lots of great reasons to plant trees. Beauty and shade are obvious, but did you know that two mature trees can produce enough oxygen for a family of four? Trees are valuable resources that will take care of you if you take care of them. You have to think long term with trees. They're going to be there for a long time and probably longer than you if you pick the right tree. According to Master Arborist Gabe Beeler from Sacramento, California, the easiest thing you can do for the health of your tree is remember three words. Location, location, location. Just like prime real estate, if you plant a tree in the right place, it'll reward you again and again. But if you don't... 90% of the trees that I remove as a company were because they were put in the wrong place. The majority of tree roots on most landscape trees are in the top two feet of soil and run laterally one and a half times the distance of the canopy. Given that, the air Gabe sees most often is a tree planted too close to the house, the driveway, the street, and especially the grass. Because if you water your trees like you water your lawn, something else will be too close, the tree's roots. Once we get all the water into that soil, it clogs a lot of the pore space and takes up room where oxygen and, and other waters would move through. So the roots have to surface to compete with the lawn in order to, to come up and get that water and that oxygen. Most trees prefer a slow, deep watering to keep the roots growing below ground where they belong. Put a two inch layer of organic mulch around the canopy and the water stays in the soil even longer. If you do see roots, they may tell you a few things about the health of the tree. That's why Gabe periodically rambles around reviewing the roots. Three main problems with roots are going to be girdling roots, and that's the roots that are constricting and, and wrapping around other roots and, and cutting off the vascular flow and causing rot. This here is the beginning of a girdling root crossing across here. Gabe says ungirdling a root can be done pretty easily. Using a sharp blade, his first cut is on the side farthest from the base. Then he peels the root back toward the tree and cuts along the root that was being girdled. Cracks, decay, or growths like these mushrooms, however, begin to necessitate the services of a certified arborist. These things signify interior problems that could threaten the life of the tree. You can look elsewhere for potential hazards as well. From the base and up into space, Gabe suggests a gander skyward at the tree's structure, specifically the angle the branches connect to the central leader. 
This would be a 90 degree angle, which is great, excellent. Anytime you have a U between the branch and the trunk, you're in good shape. When we start working it up and it starts turning into a tight V and gets above that 30 degree mark, then we begin to have some problems. Branches with small angles tend to be weaker by design, thus require more care and maintenance over the lifespan of the tree. But improving branch and trunk is one of the best reasons for pruning. It's good to have pruning in the first three years to develop structure. There's a lot of flaws that uh, young trees have that can be rectified really easily um, when they're smaller with a pair of hand pruners as opposed to having a guy go up 80 feet and use a chainsaw. Before you grab the pruners, though, know what you want to achieve. This is a good example of a co-dominant stem. For example, this tree has three weakly attached trunks. Look a little closer and you'll see four inches of holding wood below, supporting eight inches of trunk above. One strong wind could cause some real damage. The tree behind me is also an example of uh, co-dominant stems with included bark. And that's something that can be fixed really easily when we get a young tree. This is a tree that just came from the nursery and it's going to develop the same problems if left alone. This tree is supposed to have one central leader, but as you can see, it has two. Gabe chooses one that'll be the trunk and on the other, he makes what's called a suppression cut. A small cut above a bud facing outward suppresses growth, turning the leader into a branch. This is a part of the tree that we don't want to make any pruning cuts on. Of course, if you have any concerns about making pruning cuts, well, that's one more fine reason to get an arborist out to look at your trees. They'll help you maintain healthy, safe, good-looking trees. And that, my friends, is how you keep your investment growing strong year after year. Trees hold a different significance for everybody. Everybody has their own feelings about trees. Which is the reason why that we try to protect them so much is because in the life of a 150 year old tree there will have been maybe 10 people that lived under it and everybody had different feelings about it. By the way, limbs and branches are supposed to fall from trees. It's nature's way of tidying up. And with well over 100 trees here in my landscape, believe me, I spend a whole lot of time tidying up too. Coming up, I'll wrangle some weeds. This weeder also features prongs and a spring-loaded mechanism, but it works in an entirely different fashion. It's not exactly love at first sight. I hate this. Sometimes it seems as though I spend too much time talking about weeds. But then I remind myself that people ask me more questions about weeds than any other single gardening topic bar none. And that's understandable. After all, weeds are the bane of gardeners everywhere. And there's no getting around the fact that weeds are everywhere. I prefer to get rid of weeds using mechanical methods rather than relying on herbicides, whether organic or synthetic. And basically, that means pulling them either by hand or by using some sort of mechanical device. And here are three such devices, all of which I'm going to demonstrate. The first is one I've used for years. It features prongs at one end, they look like nails actually, a sliding spring-loaded mechanism, and at the other end, there's a crank. All you do is stab the prongs into the center of a weed clump, get the crank a few turns, and with very little effort, the weed is spun right out of the ground. You then slide the spring-loaded mechanism toward the weed and it pops right off. This weeder works especially well on grassy weeds, such as crabgrass, or those with deep taproots like dandelions. This weeder also features prongs and a spring-loaded mechanism, but it works in an entirely different fashion. <laughs> With this model, you stab the prongs in the soil off to one side of the weed, then step on the plate opposite the prongs to pop the weed right out of the ground. And again, this works reasonably well on grassy weeds, but it's not all that effective on weeds with deep tap roots because it tends to snap the tap root rather than lift it out of the ground completely. And in many cases, that means the weed will ultimately return. This last weeding device is based on a design that's easily several hundred years old, and it's little more than a wooden handle with a corkscrew attached. To use, you simply stab the corkscrew into the center of a weed and give the handle a few turns. The weed comes out of the ground, roots and all, with 
little effort. What I like most about these weeding tools is their long handles, because it means you don't have to bend over and strain your back while weeding. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. You see, what I like most about these weeding tools is that they're fun to use. <laughs> Look out, weeds, here I come. That does it for today, gang. But remember, if there's anything more you'd like to learn about today's show, just log on to our website. I'm Paul James, the Gardener Guy for Gardening by the Yard. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.